Well, it's great to be with you here at Metro. I look forward usually once a term to come and speaking at Metro and um, especially today, Pentecost Sunday. What an amazing day to be coming to share with you. And uh, it's linked with that that I want to share the subject for this evening. I want to speak about a renewed Holy Spirit inspired confidence. One of the things about the day of Pentecost was the disciples had been very fearful. They were behind locked doors, terrified of the future, confused as to what the future would be because they'd been so disappointed what just recently happened. And then the Holy Spirit comes and fills them and changes everything. And one of the things that really changes is this sense of a new confidence. These frightened, behind locked doors disciples suddenly are out in the crowd communicating a renewed confidence in the gospel, a new confidence in God's faithfulness, a new confidence in God's protection, a new confidence in God's power at work in them. And it's that I want to just unfold. And my prayer is that here on this Pentecost Sunday, for many of us, there'll be a renewed experience of the Holy Spirit stirring in us that confidence. I really pray, and my prayer has been that tonight for some of us, we really feel something birthed in us, something, that fresh confidence in the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to take a, a, a few kind of scriptures that have each had a kind of prophetic edge to them. So this is more than just a reflection on a record of scripture. It's sensing those now words God speaking to our lives. And if you're taking notes, you can follow them carefully or else follow them later, I'm sure, on, online. But the first of those scriptures is taken from Philippians chapter 1, and hopefully it'll come up. Each of these will speak about confidence. The Holy Spirit inspiring confidence in us. And the first is from Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we can feel confident about something when it first happens or we first think about it or sense God stirring something in our hearts. But the challenge is to hold on to that confidence. It's so easy to find that discouragements come, disappointments. We live in a world today where there are lots of fears and anxieties around that are robbing people of real confidence. I mean, just the light of all that's happened this weekend in these recent days in Manchester, in London, with the terrorist attacks has meant for some people, it's, I heard somebody being interviewed and they said, it's really, it's not my confidence. I, I feel nervous about life. Or whether it's sometimes Brexit or uncertainty financially. And so often we live in a world with a lot of uncertainty. What does it mean to find a real confidence in God? A confidence where God has sown seeds into our hearts. Whenever God puts a promise God brings it to fulfillment, where God sows those incorruptible seeds in our hearts. It may be a sense of God's call on our life. It may be uh, something God stirred in us for our, our career, for our aspirations that God has for our lives. How can we feel a confidence in God bringing that through? One of the areas that's been interesting over recent years to be praying into has been and it's particularly relevant here at, um, at Metro because there's a, a lovely couple. They're not yet, Ed and Caroline not here tonight, are they? they? So Ed and Caroline are a couple that have been very much part of Metro, and um, we've been praying for them to have a child. They'd long to have a family. And uh, we've been praying for quite a long time, and uh, they've gone through some really disappointing times where they've become pregnant and then lost a child. And some of you think, well, Rob, wouldn't it be better for them never to become pregnant than to become pregnant than have the disappointment? And it's been one of those roller coaster experiences. And yet, it's been wonderful as we pray for them to really sense a confidence that God will bring this to completion. And so, just in these recent days, they've given birth to a lovely child called Noah, and it's been wonderful to rejoice with them. And, and for Philip and Kate, it's been great as part of this journey. Before Metro, there was what was called the bridge, which is the passing. There was another couple there who almost threw the early days of a bridge reef, for longing for a child. And, and I've seen God do some miraculous ways in which he's given that fulfillment of promises with regard to family. I remember I used to go to um, to Africa each year, and uh, I, I, usually around Easter time. And I went one uh, one year to Africa, and um, these were amazing times. It was usually over an Easter weekend, just maybe for, and um, uh, there were amazing times of ministry and preaching and teaching. So many come to faith, many leaders today in some of those African churches. I can remember just as students like yourself first coming to the Lord. But we sometimes have meetings going all night. They have a big bonfire and they praise and worship around this. And I don't know if they did it on shifts, but I certainly was bleary eyed by the but all and they'd be worshiping. But some amazing times of prayer and ministry. So I arrived this um, Good Friday, and uh, as I arrived, there was a, a bit of commotion near the camp, and there was a, a young couple who um, had for 16 years been trying to have a child, 
They'd long to have a child. In Africa, it's a big thing, having a child. And in fact, in their village, the village, which was out in a remote area, had really brought a lot of pressure on them, their parents and others, because they felt there was a curse on them if they didn't have a child. And so they'd asked particularly for prayer. And I can still remember, I'd really just arrived. We were in a circle, and there was some um, sort of straw uh, chairs around, but we were all standing. And I can remember they asked if we could pray. And, just let, and I can remember praying as I laid hands on this dear woman. As I prayed, just a young woman, she fell backwards into this sort of baskety chair. And as I prayed, or I really felt that sense of God's promise that by this time next year, you'll be carrying a child. That's the way it happened with Abraham and Sarah and those promises. Now, the amazing thing when you're praying for something like that, it's not quite like a broken arm where you see it mended or something, you know, you, you, you really got away. But the next year, I remember going and as I arrived at the camp, they were there literally at the gate of the camp with his little baby in their arms. They called the baby Camp Bell because in their village they rang a bell whenever anything supernatural happened. And because it had happened at camp, they, they called the baby Campbell, or we would say Campbell, but Camp Bell. And uh, it was amazing just sense. Now, I need to say, because I've often prayed, I pray every day for a number of folk who, and in fact, some even here with regard to the whole gift of family. God gives family in different ways. Of course, it's not necessarily always through pregnancy. I have one lovely couple who really felt for them God wanted them to foster children from needy children. And that was the way God gave them family. And, and I've seen a number of different ways in which God has done it. But those situations where God begins a good work, gives a sense of promise, sows a seed, and how we hold on to that promise to see it come to completion. Now, for some of us here, there may be things in your life, maybe a sense of God's call on your life, and things have happened that have robbed you of the confidence in it. Things have undermined that confidence. My prayer is today on this Pentecost Sunday, before the end of this evening, I want to pray, come Holy Spirit, just renew that inspired sense of confidence in you. The second of these scriptures speaks of confidence again, and it's taken from um, the Psalms, and it's, um, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Now, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Now, strongholds can be good or bad. A stronghold is a kind of mindset. Sometimes it's a bit like a scratch record where, you know, you, you may have part of your favorite collection. A record's got, well, we don't have the vinyls, but they come back in again now. But, uh, you know, a scratch record. And whenever you put the record on, it always goes into that groove. Uh, every time you play, it always gets there. And sometimes in our lives, uh, we can develop habits, mindsets, tendencies, vulnerabilities that mean whenever we're in those situations or association, we always find that same air of weakness and vulnerability. The Bible speaks about how we try to deal with strongholds. I mean, either be a stronghold, sometimes it can be a life-controlling habit. Well, here the psalmist is saying, but the Lord has become the stronghold of my life because I've found my confidence in him. For some people, that whole air of stronghold can be linked with anxiety, where there's a real vulnerability to anxiety. Maybe someone here tonight, and you, you struggle from panic attacks. And it's just a sheer vulnerability. Two people can hear the same news, but for you, it's always this tendency of, of anxiety and a tendency towards fear. I had a neighbor once, and um, he was a really anxious person. Everything in life was really hard going. And... Uh, uh, I had many conversations with him about life and different situations. And one, one Saturday, he was coming back from shopping. And uh, I can still remember because he had his, his shopping bags. I won't name what was the name on the shopping bag. But anyway, a local supermarket. And he was carrying his bags back. And uh, he was a nervous wreck because normally just to choose between whether you buy baked beans or, uh, I, I don't know, something else, uh, it was a big decision for him. And he had a whole afternoon trying to decide what he was going to buy. And so he's really, and he said to me, you know, he said, oh, Rob, he says, oh, I feel absolutely exhausted. He said, Rob, do you think you could help me? I said, yeah, well, what's that, John? He said, I, I, I'd love if you could just witness some papers I need to get signed. I said, certainly. So I went in his house, and he had these papers out on his table. I said, what's it all about, John? Now, I remember John was nervous about buying a tin of baked beans. He said, actually, 
I'm thinking about buying a house, he said. I said, really, John? Goodness me, because he was just renting this place next door. He was in a flat. And uh, so uh, I said, well, John, that's a big deal. And he said, yeah, I know. He said, I haven't been able to sleep day and night for the last few weeks just thinking about it all. He said, but anyway, I've got to get these papers signed and witnessed. So do you think so? I said, yeah. I'll. So he, he, he put the papers out and I got a pen. I'm about to say, he said, wait a minute, Rob. He said, wait a minute. He said, do you think I'm doing the right thing here? I said, well, John, it's a big decision to make. He said, well, Rob, what do you do when you've got big decisions to make? I said, do you want me, do you want me to tell you, John, what I do when I get big? He said, yes, if, you know, is this some book about six easy ways to make the big decisions of life? You know, those kind of DIY books. He said, yeah, he said, Rob, tell me. I said, well, John, I, I pray. Yeah, you wouldn't pray about something like this, though, would you? Yeah, I pray about everything, John. What, you mean you pray about buying a house? Is God in? Yeah, God's in everything in our life. Wow, he said. I said, John, would you like me to pray for you buying this, he said, I'd love you to. Next time you go to church, send one up for me, will you? Uh, and I said, well, John, I could pray now, here. Well, in my place, he said. I don't know, anyone ever pray in my place? He said, yeah, I could pray here now. Oh, okay, if that's okay, he said. So I put my hand on these papers and my hand on John's shoulder, and I began to pray. It was only a short prayer, but just really praying that God would guide, that he'd sense God's direction in this situation. And as I finished praying, there was tears coming down, rolling down John's cheek. And he was a, he was a f mature fellow. He's just doing his finals regard to dentistry. And uh, um, I said, John, it's great to be praying. He said, Rob, I, I've never heard anybody pray like that. He said, I was looking around almost as if you were talking to somebody in the room. I said, but we can talk to God like that, John. Oh, he said, I wish I could know God like that. I said, John, you can. I pulled out of my pocket a little, you'll smile some, you know, because I'm always kind of, actually it's in my jacket pocket over there, but there we are, <laughs> uh, a little copy of John's Gospel. And I said, John, you know, it says here, look, Jesus says, I have come, you want to have life and life in all its fullness. Wow, he said, do you think that could be for me? I said, yeah, John. He said, can I borrow it? So I lent it to him. There were about six weeks between signing that paper and John eventually moving. Over those six weeks, every week, I saw John, and we went through a different part of John's gospel. At the end of the six weeks, John became a Christian. And then he became a Christian, but boy, it brought a confidence to his life. He passed his finals, became a senior partner in a dentistry practice, became a church leader. John, a church leader you could never imagine. But what happened? He found a confidence in God that had changed his perspective of life. It even broken through a stronghold, a, and a tendency constantly towards that vulnerability of anxiety. For all of us here, there may be challenges in our lives. What are those strongholds? What does it mean to be able to say, the Lord is the stronghold of my life? My confidence is in him. The next of these verses and uh, goes on to Proverbs, and um, it's an amazing verse that says, have no fear in sudden disaster, or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. For many people, in the light of what's been happening through some of the tragic uh, terrorist attacks, there's been this sense of fear of sudden disaster. Someone said to me the day, Robert, this could happen in Bristol, Rob. It could happen in, in the centre of Bristol as easy as it could in London or Manchester. And, and Rob, I just, feel, I just feel fearful every time I go out of the house now. Or sometimes it may be other areas of vulnerability, just fearful of health issues, fearful of an accident. And there are some people who live constantly in that sense of fear. In fact, the Bible speaks about we can live all our lives sometimes enslaved to the fear of death. So a few weeks ago, I was talking to a lady at Woody's after a service, and we were, he came for prayer. He said, Rob, all my life I have been fearful of sudden disaster. I said, Really? Yeah, she said, even when the children were growing up and I would see them off to school, as they left going to school, I was always fearful that I might never see them again, that they'd be run down with a road accident around the corner or something would happen to them. I was always fearful. I never let them go on any of these kind of risky holidays like, you know, skiing or whitewater rafting. I, I, I never let them go through anything that was dangerous. I was always fearful. And I never let them go together to anything that was dangerous in case I lost them at the same time. He said, he said but these last few weeks, they've now grown up. They've got their own families. And all of them, I think it was going to be the week after next, all of them are going on a skiing holiday to Switzerland, all on the same flight, she says. I've not been on a sleep day or night, she says, for the last week, just fearful of it all. And sometimes, you know, it can be like that. There's a, a kind of fear of sudden disaster. 
And this scripture, I literally, just the, the day before, read it. And it had leapt out to me, as I say, each of these scriptures have sometime over these past few months been prophetic words in my own life. And, and so I read this scripture to her. And as I prayed over, I prayed, come, Holy Spirit, come now. It's not just a few thoughts of sentimental encouragement or support, but what is it is for the Holy Spirit to bring a renewed, inspired confidence that comes from God. I saw her the day before the holiday, and it was like a different woman. She said, Rob... I've slept wonderfully, and I've really found a new confidence in God. Not just for this trip, but to have no fear of sudden disaster. That's an amazing thing. And these scriptures go on to promise more because the next one says that the fruit of righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. Sometimes when we think of confidence, human confidence... It's the very opposite to what the Bible speaks of as confidence. When we speak of human confidence, we usually think of, you know, someone who's really rather blasé, rather kind of arrogant and thinks, wow, I'm going to do this and I'll achieve that and I'll do that. And you say, wow, she's confident. By confidence, we mean self-assertion, kind of that sense of uh, feeling I, 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 I can do it all. But here, the Bible is speaking about a righteousness and quietness. There's not an outer blasé sort of feel of self-assertion, but an inner trust in God, an inner witness of the Holy Spirit, which brings with it a, a deep inner sense of confidence in God. So it's not me kind of self-promoting, it's the Holy Spirit inspiring in us. And that's what I want to say, because there's lots of book, books have been written about confidence and self-assertion, you know, six easy lessons to be, become self-assertive, as it were, but this is something different. This is a Holy Spirit-inspired confidence. So on that day of Pentecost for these disciples, frightened and fearful behind locked doors, what was it that changed all that? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's something very powerful about that indwelling of the Spirit of God in our lives that can bring an inner confidence, an inner assurance, faith. How do we sustain that? How do we keep that fresh? Here's the next of those verses, taken this time from Jeremiah. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. How do we sustain that confidence when we're going through dry periods, difficult experience in our lives? It speaks here of that time when there's uh, no rain, as it were, the year of drought, and yet its leaf stays green. I, as well as in Africa, I used to also each year go to India, and uh, well, every other year to India, and. Uh, I remember going to North India on one occasion to Rajasthan, which is one of the northern states. Where it's subject to drought, and this particular period I was there, they'd had a prolonged drought. And I was going with one of the national Indian workers to some remote villages, and um, on the way we went uh, along this river. I call, I say a river, it was a river bed. But it was this huge, much wider than this room, and it had completely dried up, and was just like crazy paving where it was cracked, like a motorway, as far as you could see, but completely dry. But on the side of the river, after about a mile of going along this river, there was this amazing tree that everything had shriveled up literally around. I mean, it's been for nearly a year now, complete drought. And, but this tree was a beautiful green leaves on it. And I said to the person I was with, wow, somebody must go and water that every day. He said, no, he said, that's the only tree in India whereby the roots go down deep enough. There is water down there, but the water table level is such that most plants never reach it. But that tree has got roots, that are the deepest roots of any tree in India. And they go right down to the water table. And for us, you know, in times of dryness in our spiritual lives, in times of challenge and difficulty, hardship and heartache, the health of our spiritual life doesn't depend on the thickness of the branches. It depends on the depth of the roots. What does it mean to go deep? What does it mean to sense in our lives that there's that really drawing up from that spiritual nourishment whereby our roots are not just on the surface. And it speaks about these leaves that stay green whatever the weather. 
Sometimes, you know, we can be deciduous Christians where in summer there's plenty of greenery. But as soon as hardship comes, as soon as winter comes, the leaves begin to go brown and fall. What does it mean to be confident in God even when there's drought? What does it mean to trust God? There's loads of amazing scriptures that speaks about, you know, uh, the fruit's not yet on the vine. Uh, there's not yet the harvest. But we trust you, God. What does it mean to trust God? Even when, and for some perhaps here tonight, you're going through a difficult time in your life. Maybe it's a dry patch. Maybe it's a, a situation of hardship and disappointment. What does it mean in that to be confident in God? Somehow God is in control. God has not forgotten you. God is faithful to his promises. And today on this Pentecost Sunday, you'll be saying, come, Holy Spirit, renew that confidence. Take my, do my roots deeper into God. And then this next scripture that speaks about a confidence in approaching God, and this is the final one of our scriptures. So, And uh, it's particularly the power there is in prayer and being able to come before God in prayer. When I was with you, I think last time or time before, we were talking about communion and we took that picture of the Old Testament whereby there was the holy place in the temple and there was the holy of holies where a curtain divided and no one could ever enter that apart from the high priest. And, and then when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain was opened. It was torn apart and there was a new and living way into God's presence that had come through the cross of Jesus. Through his sacrifice, he'd made it possible for us to know what it is to be forgiven, to be able to know the reality of God's presence in our life, to be able to talk with God like with a friend. And here it takes up this thought again in Hebrews. Um, let's approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Now the thought of the throne of God and the glory of God would have been something that seemed unapproachable. And yet, there is a Holy Spirit-inspired confidence that comes, that makes us feel that we can draw near to God. And it goes on to say that we may find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Now, firstly, in this passage in Hebrews, it speaks of that confidence because we're coming to someone who we're confident understands what we're going through. You know, sometimes you, you may talk with somebody or be counseling someone, and you say to them, have you ever shared this with anybody? No, I, I've never felt I could really share it with anybody. Why is that? I don't think anybody would understand. I don't think anybody would, really, would know what I'm going through. Sometimes you only feel confident to share when you feel you're sharing with someone who would understand. So here in this passage in the Hebrews, it says, when we come to God, we're coming to someone like a, like a high priest who is touched with every feeling, who understands all we're going through. One of the amazing things about Jesus as a man on the earth was he went through the full extremity of every human passion. Let me say sometimes, but how could Jesus understand what it means to be desperate alone after you've been married for 50 years and your, your partner has died? Because Jesus never experienced that. Now, he may not have experienced it through the loss of a partner for 50 years, but Jesus experienced loneliness when he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced loneliness when it was to be forsaken by his closest friends, when it was to be denied and betrayed by them. So Jesus experienced that, that passion of loneliness. Jesus experienced every human passion to its full extremity. And therefore, there's no, no feelings we can go through that he doesn't understand. And so Hebrews says, he is touched with every feeling of our weakness. Now, you may be here tonight, you think, well, Rob... The things I'm going through, and I, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who I feel would really understand because I'm not sure there's anybody who'd, who'd been through that. When we come to Jesus, we come into someone who fully understands. And therefore, there's a confidence to be able to approach him and not just to find sympathy and empathy, but grace to help us at that point of need. It's wonderful when we pray to really sense that there's a Father who loves us and wants the best for us. But it's more than just that he understands and empathizes. He has power to meet that need. It's like two beggars, I don't know, two tramps down in the bear pit or something on a cold winter's night. And one says to the other, I'm hungry. Really? I'm hungry too. Yeah, I I'm cold. Well, really, I'm cold too. I'm starving. It'll be a they understand each other. They really empathize with each other. They really... They can't help each other. So it's more than empathy. 
When we come to Jesus, we're coming to someone who understands how we feel but has the power to meet that need. And it's a confidence in that that affects the way we pray. If we really believe, he can make that difference. Just a few, well, week before last, I was uh, speaking at a church here in Bristol in a Sunday morning, and I'd been there some months earlier. And this links a little bit what we were sharing at the beginning about God answering prayer, particularly in the gift with regard to family. A young couple came at the end of the service and asked for prayer. She was heavily pregnant, and uh, but was very upset. She was crying as she came. She said, she said, could you pray for me? And I said, I'd love to be able to pray for you. And do you want me to pray? And I said, yes, please. She said, you know, I'm pregnant. She said, but for some time now, there's been no movement. And she was convinced that the baby had died. Tragically, you know, every, every day in this country, 15 babies die, either just before or during or immediately after birth. And there's that heartache and pain. And she was really convinced that this child was going to be stillborn. She said she'd not felt any movement for quite a long time and was really desperately concerned. And, and as I was about to pray for her, I said, let me tell you a story a moment. I said, you know, in the Bible, there's an amazing story about when Jesus uh, was going to visit a relative, Jesus' mother, Mary, was going to visit Elizabeth to tell her about the birth of Jesus. And when she comes and tells the story of how Jesus can be born as the saviour of the world, this amazing news, Elizabeth, who was pregnant, it says at that moment, she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the baby leapt in her womb. I said, as I pray for you now, I'm going to pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like on that Pentecost, that first Pentecost. And as I pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to pray that this child in your womb will leap. She looked at me with utter amazement. But this, for me, was a confidence that God could do this. And I can remember just reaching out and praying for her. And as I prayed for her husband beside her, I stretched out my hand. I said, oh, God, just stretch out your hand now. Fill this, your handmaiden now. Fill her with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, stir this baby in a womb to leap. And literally, as I prayed that, my hand on her hand, I could feel her whole body shake. She looked at me and said, the baby just leapt in my womb, she says. And she looked with such excitement that I've been crying. I went just a week before last to the same church. She was a little baby who'd been born. And amazing miracles around it. My prayer here tonight is on this Pentecost Sunday. For some of you where there may be hopes or dreams that have died. Where may be things God stood in your life that you've given up on, you've lost confidence. I'm going to pray here tonight that you might experience afresh on this Pentecost Sunday that renewed Holy Spirit inspired confidence. If tonight... You'd love to experience that. On this Pentecost Sunday, I'm going to pray, come Holy Spirit. Just stand where you are. I'm going to pray for you. I'm just going to pray for that fresh touch of the Spirit. Bless you, those who are already standing. Just If there's others who want to stand this evening, and I'm going to pray that God will come on this Pentecost Sunday. Come Holy Spirit, just fill us afresh. Father, we thank you again for your word. These amazing promises. And I pray now here tonight, whatever seed you have sown in the hearts of these, your children, whatever hopes, whatever expectations, Lord, here tonight that you bring to birth or rebirth in them where something that just feels dead or gone cold, a renewed Holy Spirit-inspired confidence. Fill us, Lord. Here on this Pentecost Sunday, we say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Wind and fire, blow upon us. Release your purposes, I pray. Stir now that renewed confidence in you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen.